Yeah, there, there are a lot of us for the moderated talk, so I suppose we'll kind of do a blitz question and answers. Are you ready? <laughs> I suppose. I'm ready. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, your, uh, your speech that you were quitting gave me a pretty, pretty thought. It was provoking. Uh, so I'm wondering, it's a question about, about Rafael. Uh, but what circumstance will you quit you to I? Because I'm, I'm asking the same for myself about Camp Light. It's very interesting. Do, do you have something in mind? Uh, so, actually, the truth is that I quit that uh, in 2008. Oh, yes. So, actually, I, I, I started working there in 2006 and 2008 I quit. So, this was the crisis, more or less. I got better offer from, from a colleague. Uh, work at Nokia, so I decided yeah, let's do it. But I actually I quit it like physically, but I never quit it like mentally. So this company is always in, in my mind, you know. Uh, so I rejoined 2010. So, so yeah, I rejoined B2I 2010, and I'm still here. Uh, but what would make me quit again? <laughs> I think for good. <laughs> for a good and maybe for another time. So I think it would be. Uh, something uh, like different. I mean, if there's something I'd like to build on my own, and I know I'm not able to do it with the people who are at it right now, I think I would think about doing it, you know, on my own. I would, then I would think about quitting. And actually, many people left it why started their own businesses, and we work with them no, still. So we actually we give them our clients, you know. So, so for example, they're like they're at least like five software houses in Krakow who are basically born, uh, bro uh, uh, born from U2i, yes? And we cooperate with them. So the U2i family is bigger. There's not only 50 of us, but it's like, uh, I think there are like 300 people, but in different companies. So I think, yeah, what would make me leave is probably that I would like to build something different than U2i. Thank you. I have one question in Slido about Stefan in ST6 as, as a whole. Uh, ST6, you try three letters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, have you noticed, noticed some uh, gender, age, or personality differences when it comes to sales and salaries? Can you repeat can also introduce yourself. I am uh, Kirill. My Obviously, my name is Kirill. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders and um, one of the co-founders of ST6. We honestly, we like, we haven't we haven't found. I mean, we're, we're a small team. We're 14 people, so we we haven't had a whole lot of time to derive patterns based on gender or any other character, age or any other characteristics in terms of uh, how people behave when they set their own salaries. So what we've observed so far, um, basically people, it, it, obviously there's a difference in, in age because um, you know the more junior people, and we don't have a whole lot of them, but more junior people are obviously going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, they're going to be impressed by the more senior people, so they're going to feel a little bit more uncomfortable about maybe asking for a higher salary than they should. But that's about it. Do you want to add something? No, not for us. Totally random that there is no diversity on the right now. Yeah. Totally random. It, it was uh, pretty interesting because I saw a blog article in Corporate Rebels uh, about U2I. Uh, and I was very interested in the idea of Sherpas. Do you have a sh you said you have a Sherpa, but you're yeah. yourself a Sherpa. Can you explain explain that dynamic? I mean, what, what does it mean to be a Sherpa? Yeah, I briefly uh, briefly introduced the uh, role of the Sherpa uh, during my presentation. Like in short, it's a person who helps you to find your path uh, at it why. So it means that like uh, we all are programmers, almost uh, obviously, but sometimes people have different ideas so for instance like uh, there was a guy who, uh, 
who created because like he talked to the sheriff like to his sheriff how we want to like in, in develop his leadership skills so he created it's called the U2A lab essentially so it's a, a, a circle talking about the social like currency terms that um, uh, learns new technologies because like we do mostly web development but uh, obviously they like different like languages uh, frameworks that we want to test so they create like some internal small projects um, so like when you uh, work with your Sherpa you just like find try to find your own path because they're like junior people I don't know what to do and this is also okay because sometimes you just like if you don't know we don't want to focus on technology but once you develop you want to something more and also, also it requires sometimes coaching maybe people do know their path already but they want to carve the way maybe like first steps and so on so it's very subjective like from one person to another like from one shepherd to another but also like Sherpa is responsible for the progression so once you you and your Sherpa or your Sherpa and, and you think that you're ready for like progression you just work the story you gather feedback from your peers and you post this on uh, publicly on Slack channel interesting uh, I have other questions from Slido. Does somebody want to add something? Yeah, maybe there. We are related to Sherpa Carl in the world conference. Are we all the level developers or...? Maybe I will, I will repeat the question uh, about Sherpas. How do you level the... Because Sherpa <coughs> is sounds like more like coach mentor. Yeah. And it's interesting in all companies how do you uh, level the people. Do you have such levels? So, sorry. Do you have levels in the companies? Yeah. And how do you level level yeah, people? How do you level? Is it just the sugar? Is it like a circle? Let's say, okay, that's okay. This year. It's that question is also about ST6 and you yeah, both. Yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe Stefan can answer. Yes, yeah, so for uh, from our experience, it's kind of quote and quote very easy to level the people because ultimately we as U2I are a consulting company. So if you can sell quote unquote sell somebody for a given rate uh, and he or she delivers uh, on that, that's the the value and that's that's the experience that that the guy have or the the guys have. And in terms of right now, we're not that many people, so we don't have a formal uh, leveling. Our leveling is based on uh, uh, for what price. It might sound like a, a more market-driven approach. It for what price a person can be uh, can be contracted as a consultant. Um, yeah, we ultimately, um, you know, the customer is always right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if we can if we can offer our services and you know we're confident that the person is going to deliver on the level of a let's say what they expect uh, from a lead uh, software engineer, uh, and they are performing at that level and the customer is happy, then that's quite easy for us to get that market validation that that is ex you know approximately the level of that person. Uh, and we can do that since we have multiple projects. We can move the person across several different projects and see how they perform. And over time, it just kind of for us, it's fairly easy. Uh, so, um, we have a ranking system, which actually, as I said, like it's detached from uh, from your role. So, in short, it's just like how the company values you. And obviously, like it also, it was like very organic. So initially, we just uh, set some like salary, like a base average salary in the market, and then we just increase it by thirty percent because we really wanted to overprice our developers. Uh, but at at some point, we actually wanted to uh, create some thresholds, some frames to those ranks because those ranks are just numbers which are like strictly attached to your salary, and that's it. Uh, and uh, we in the company in teams we met and we just we have like so, uh, like 11 ranks and uh, we discussed like internally in teams like okay what do you mean by rank like from let's say four to six oh this is junior what do you mean 
like the, it's somebody's a junior person. Oh, by that and that and that. And the senior, okay, this is it. And then we have see, like leaders. What does it mean? So we have like a definition, but it's not nothing like set in stone. It's just like rough guidelines. So we, when you promote somebody to rank, let's say 12, people will have at least some idea what does it mean. But it's still like nothing like a, a guideline or actually like a list of checkboxes that you need to fill. I have a question um, to, to Stefan um, about the decision by consent. Um, I know in sociocracy, well, the idea is to come quickly to decisions <coughs> in groups. Is this the case with you? Do you have cases when you go through the circles too long and it, in fact instead of quick decision is too slow decision? What, what is your observation regarding the timing of reaching the decision by consent? Uh, so, yeah, for the... Um, if, if the decision is, is like uh, affecting the whole company, it usually takes takes a lot of time to, to come to uh, a final consent around it. Uh, if it's something small, actually, uh, it's very easy to, to consent to, to something that has already been seen, the driver is quite clear, and uh, everybody agrees that, that, that this is the right decision to, to go. So, it's like exponentially, if, if the, the, the problem affects the whole company, usually uh, the decision-making process takes, takes more time. So, and it's, it's not easy, especially for those like hard decisions, because uh, as I mentioned, you're like uh, leaning to, to make a decision quickly. But for those like hard decisions, the best way is to like take your time and think through it more thoroughly and uh, have a decision. So after some time, do you say, okay, we'll postpone it? Or uh, yeah, so uh, um, we, we, we usually don't set hard deadlines, we, we set those deadlines in terms of, of quarters, so at least for, let's say, I'm going to give you a real example, for, for this quarter, we want to have the role for uh, self-set sales process, like defined and have picked up a an individual that can take the head of that role. So that's for this like decision, it will affect everybody, so we will have like three or four months in order to nail this down. Uh, and for example, we have other, other, other important decisions in the company, we want to have, to have some kind of a restructuring of the company, and to know that it's, it's going to take a time, we need to have a research on it, so again, that's a like decision that will take a couple of months. So based on the impact of the decision, the the time to make a final consent is usually exponentially close. Somebody else? Yeah, I have a question. I can say about our decision making. I think decision making is the hottest topic, one of the hottest, hottest topic I did why. Because it, then it can take ages to make uh, any decision, and from my experience, I think there need to be an owner of this decision. If there is, no, if there, it's, it's, let's say, there's an idea, yeah, somebody throws an idea, nothing happens with this. Yeah? I mean, the people are frustrated, or nothing happens. There's no decision. I think there need to be a strong owner of this of this of this of, of, this, of this idea who will, will drive through all kind of different processes until the. A decision, yeah, it might be yes or no, but yeah. So uh, decision making in this kind of uh, organizations is very, uh, is very uh, hot topic. And, and uh, do you have examples? That's a question for both companies about similar, similar companies like yours, but in a bigger scale. I mean, like for S6 sociocratic companies that are like more than 300 people. With, for you to have some companies that are having something similar or alternative to Sherpa model, and uh, but just on bigger scale. Can you think of something like that, like an example? 
I believe there are companies like that, but I think this is something that we are struggling also. Like I said, that we are a company of 50 people because this is like by some research, this is the uh, the boundary that you know, like the, the, the tribalism. Actually, you can keep like close relationship with those people. Like when you extend that, then you need to create some kind of structure, or you can split. So like I know that obviously like we all evolve in different way. So it means that like I can imagine that there is a single company like like you I Maybe we share some some values or some some uh, um, some cadences, but I don't think there is same thing in the same company. I know some, but they split, or they create structure, or maybe they have this like but in smaller teams. So like they have a structure on the organizational level, but within teams like smaller teams projects they maintain this like self-organizing culture. Um, we, we know a few companies that have <coughs> what they call teal or some sort of teal organization. Obviously, uh, uh, they're, not they're not exactly alike. Uh, one of them is Vincent. They're out of uh, uh, Finland. Uh, Finland ha um, Vincent has about 400 people, 500 people. Um, and they were at the last, uh, one of their representatives was at the last uh, uh, Reinventing Organizations conference. Um, Valve, the company that makes video games, um, they, they have a very similar structure as well. And I don't know, maybe there are about 500 people in there, maybe 1,000, I'm not sure exactly how big they are. Uh, but um, this question actually comes up every single time that we you know, we try to present, we present our company. And uh, it's very interesting that people ask that question, but the other question that they don't seem to ask themselves is uh, uh, how, do you, how do you grow a company? Uh, do you grow a company by early on saying this is going to be, you know, from 50 people, and let's say that's the breaking point, from 50 people to 50,000 or to 10,000? Or that's depending on how big the company is going to get. From 50 people, you're going to say the structure of the company is going to be X, Y, and Z. That's going to be the structure of the company. And this is not going to change from 50 to 1,000 to 5,000 to 50,000. If that's the idea, that is, that's just seems completely insane. <coughs> completely insane. And the reason why we say that is because we work in the software industry. And we work on really large software. And when you work on really large software, you understand that the complexity of the software grows exponentially, the, or not, maybe not exponentially, but it grows dramatically as things get, uh, uh, as the size expands. And as the complexity grows, so do the problems. So if you think that you're going to solve these problems by having uh, you know, that fixed structure right from the start, uh, you're going about it incorrectly. In, software, in the software industry, you go through multiple validation loops, you go through experimentation, testing, validation. Uh, you go to the market, you test it with the market, you come back, you make modifications. And that, that goes on, it's an iterative process of developing the, the software, and it works for large organizations. Interestingly enough, nobody applies that to their own internal human organization. They you know, apply it to the software organization, they don't do it to the human organization. And that is, that is mind-boggling. It is extremely, extremely, extremely uh, crazy to think that you can, you know, you can manage these complexities without having an adaptive mechanism of improvement, and that's what we're we're building when we start our when we're starting our company is a mechanism to improve and a mechanism to evaluate things and make sure that we're making changes based on the different based on the circumstance circumstances. We know that when we reach 100 people, it's going to be completely different from what it is now, but we're having. Uh, uh, Values and processes and mechanism and knowledge and, and everything is going to be in place to manage those different challenges. One yeah. last question. Yeah, I just want to to say one more thing about um, because you asked me a similar question a couple of months ago about uh, why why do I need to grow your organization? Why why organizations have to become bigger and bigger and bigger? And that's a good question that everybody should ask ask. Uh, uh, its own organization. So the only viable reason is to, to bring more value and to solve problems into, into the world and like create create value. 
if you want slowly grow to like have more more people, manage more people, or uh, create more revenue, that's not going to scale in the long run. So ultimately, you have to bring more value, and the only way to bring more value uh, through your organization is to ultimately uh, grow the organization itself. In terms of not only people, but in terms of uh, maturity process and so on. Thank you, I believe that we are out of time already. <laughs> so there will not be a last question. Five minutes. <laughs> no, no more five minutes. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe you can ask the panelists after, after the break. So before that, I just want to thank you all. <laughs>